Happy Sabbath, Brinklow. What a wonderful panel discussion, wasn't it? Let's give them another. Amen. Very courageous, very courageous. Thank the panelists for sharing with us today that God can certainly use us in public service in very courageous ways. I want to thank the pastors of Emmanuel Brinklow and Pastor Medley for his courage to invite me, a political scientist and journalist. I did not invite C-SPAN here today, though. Um, I want to thank you for having me come and share with you a message on the politics of Jesus, our call to do justice. But before I begin, I want to share with you a story on my personal journey with this topic. One day, I got into a heated debate with a friend. He held the position that as Christians, we're called to do more than just feeding the poor and visiting the sick. We're called to fight injustices because Jesus, he said, was a political revolutionary. I was so offended to hear that our Lord and Savior was being called a political revolutionary. You see, as a fourth generation Adventist, I grew up on the gentle retellings of Jesus, the long suffering Jesus, the non threatening Jesus, the meek and mild Jesus. And that perception was actually reinforced in my bedtime prayer as a child. Some of you may have had the same bedtime prayer gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Look upon a little child, simplicity to come unto me, amen. That was the Jesus I knew. So my friend decided that he was gonna lend me a book called The Politics of Jesus. Written by a biblical scholar by the name of Aubrey Hendricks. A comprehensive study about the life and teachings of Jesus. I didn't want to accept this book because I had no intentions of reading it. But my friend had left it at my house. So the book sat on my bookshelf for a year unread. Year two, unread. It was approaching year three when I said, you know, I need to get this book out of my house. And in an effort to do that, I will add it to my list of New Year's resolution. So I did. I said, at the start of the new year, I'm going to read this book, The Politics of Jesus, and return it to my friend. But my intention was only to read a part of the book, and with great skepticism and with a critical eye. But I also felt in my spirit that I should add to my list of New Year's resolution the book to read called The Desire of Ages. Interestingly enough, I was invited to study the great controversy with our midday prayer meeting group on Wednesdays by Dina Crank. And so here I was reading The Desire of Ages in the mornings, Wednesday afternoon, joining our wonderful Brinklow family with brother and sister Spencer and sister Wesney. And just such a wonderful family we have that meet every Wednesday in Sister Sai. And in the evenings, I would read the book, The Politics of Jesus. And then I began to see a similar description. And then I began to see a similar reference about the teachings of Jesus. And I began to see a similar message about the life and teaching of Jesus. This morning, well, it's afternoon, I want to share with you that message. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day where we can come together to learn more about you and your will for our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would let everyone look past me and receive your message that you want us to know for such a time as this. 
We thank you, Lord, for sending your Holy Spirit to dwell with us. Fill us with your Spirit and help us to take one step closer to being ready and prepared for when you return. Through Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our text this morning is Mark 11, 15 through 18. Mark 11, 15 through 18. Let's read that together. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seat of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man shall carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called all nations of the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. When we read this text, we often just focus on Jesus turning over the money table. But it was more than just a religious act. Let's look again at verse 16. You see, Jesus and his disciples seize the temple. In today's vernacular, we would say they did a sit-in. That's a sit-in, what they did, refusing to let the priests come back in the temple and do business as usual. A sit-in. Here is why it was also more than just a religious act. The temple was not just the religious center of Jewish worship. It was the economic center of power for Israel. In a very real sense, the temple was the central bank and treasury for Israel, an economic institution. It was at the temple that the priests represented the Romans. It was at the temple where the priests collected taxes to place in the hands of the Romans. It was at the temple where the priests held court. It was at the temple where the priests would make proclamations that affected the life of every Jew. So this stance of Jesus turning over the money table was a very public attack against the economic institution of all of Israel. Because now Jesus just interfered with how the Romans were gonna get their money collected. And he stopped commercial operations for the day. Can you imagine someone doing that today? Shutting down the New York Stock Exchange with 12 of your boys? <laughs> Let's remember the period and the political conditions of the day. So Jesus was born under Roman occupation of Israel. Remember now, the Israelites had found themselves being conquered by one power after another. The Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And the Roman oppression was very cruel. The Jewish people suffered tremendously. There were beatings and public crucifixions. You had homeless poor roaming the countryside. There was multiple taxes, religious taxes, and secular taxes that kept them poor and hungry. As a matter of fact, Ellen G. White says that Joseph and Mary were not just poor, they were peasants. And she says that Jesus was familiar with poverty, hardship, and self-denial. Because you have to understand the impact of colonization on Israel. Remember under the Babylonians, after they destroyed the temple, they deported an estimated 18,000 of Judah's elites. The Persians brought them back and gave the priest status and said, represent us to your people and we'll give you kickbacks. And so the priests began to represent the Persians, not Israel. And under Roman occupation, the priests continued this pattern of receiving kickbacks and representing their colonizers rather than God's people. And in return, the Romans protected the temple. And the Romans would dispose of anyone that the priests identified as a threat. So again, this stance that Jesus took of turning over that money table was both religious and political. 
Ellen G. White says uh, in The Desire of Ages on page 133, I'll read the last quote. Um, in the days of the Jewish independence, the Sanhedrin was the supreme court of the nation, possessing secular as well as ecclesiastic authority. Though now subordinated by the Roman governors, it still exercised a strong influence in civil as well as religious matters. So what's the key lesson here? Jesus opposed the religious and political institutions that led to oppression, depression, and progression, and he didn't stay quiet about it. Jesus spoke up, and he stood up, and he showed up to touch the world's hurt. Now, when we say that there was a political dimension to the ministry of Jesus, it doesn't mean that Jesus got involved in politics as we know it today, with its bargaining and compromises and power plays and partisanship. Jesus didn't try to wage war. He didn't try to overthrow the Roman Empire by force. He didn't try to start a political party. He didn't run for political office, but he did call others to run for public office, like Joseph and Daniel and some of the wonderful people we just heard from today, because he's still calling us to serve him in various ways, such as public office. You see, in Jesus' three short years of ministry, he couldn't do it all, right? He focused on justice. He had a message that included not just a change in individual hearts, but a message that included sweeping changes in the institutions that oppress. You see, the politics of Jesus is not self-serving. The politics of Jesus is about reaching out and touching the world's heart courageously. Going back to our text, Mark 11, Sister White in The Desire of Ages tried to explain verse 17 to us. She said, when the priestly class fled after Jesus turned over the money table, the poor remained behind and they looked to Jesus Ellen White says, Jesus, with tears in his eyes, said to them, for this cause came I into the world. I don't want us to miss this point, because Matthew 25, 41 through 46, tells us, as we prepare for our Lord's second return, that it will not be our religious practices in which our lives will be judged. It will be how we try to remedy the plight of the poor and the vulnerable and the abused and the homeless, the least of these. Going back to Ellen White, she said, the people pressed in to Christ's presence with urgent, pitiful appeals. She said, urgent, pitiful appeals. If it were today, I wonder what would be the urgent, pitiful appeal of today's most vulnerable. Because we know today the heart of the world's vulnerable is hurting. We hear their cries. We hear their cries. We hear their cries in the Black Lives Matter movement. We hear their cries in the Me Too movement. We hear their cries in the National School Walkout Movement. And we hear their cries in the Women's March on Washington and the March for Our Lives for Gun Control and the May Day March for Immigrants and the March for Justice and Equality in Oregon and the Million Workers March and the Anti-War March and the Pri People's Climate Movement and the Bring Back Our Girls Movement. We hear their cries. And let's not forget about Occupy Wall Street, where we heard the cries of the most vulnerable who lost everything in the housing market, and no one was punished for the exploitation. And let's not forget about the cries of the poor, refugees, Native Americans, and indigenous people all around the world. 
Those are the cries, those are the urgent appeals of the most vulnerable for our Savior today. When we look at the life of Jesus as our example, we see that Jesus did more than perform miracles. He did more than just feed the multitude. He did more than just heal the sick. Yet, we often limit the life of Jesus to this one-dimensional service to humanity. And while it is without question that we are called to serve God, and serve humanity in such a capacity, Jesus didn't stop there. He courageously touched the world's hurt. Sister Wife, in The Desire of Ages on page 153, she said that when Jesus was on earth, he manifested an interest in the secular affairs. She went on to say on page 51 of the Desires Ages that he tried to free people of his day from the senseless rules that bound him. And she said he was seeking to break down barriers. How do you do that without interfering in the social and political order of the day? You see, Jesus wasn't just concerned about healing their pain. He was concerned about the causes of their pain. Jesus wasn't just concerned about the symptoms of their sufferings. He was concerned about alleviating the systematic causes of their sufferings. When we focus on acts of compassion by Jesus, we get comfortable in our Christian responsibility. And we help the least of these from the comfort of our couches. We write a check, we make a donation, we make a phone call, all from a place of comfort. So what am I saying here? Well, in addition to feeding the hungry, I'm talking about speaking up for why they're hungry. In addition to clothing the poor, I'm talking about standing up against the reasons why they're poor. In addition to visiting the sick, I'm talking about speaking up about health disparities that cause minorities to suffer the most in every disease category in every developed country, regardless of health system and cost. I'm talking about standing up and speaking up and showing up in places where God can use us to touch the world's hurt. Why? because that was the example of the life and teachings of our Lord and Savior. Think about his teachings. Think about his inaugural sermon in the book of Luke. Let's look at Luke 4, 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Let's read it together. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The word here is not bruised, as the King James Version translates it. The Greek word here is pharo, pharo, which means oppress, crush, So the text reads, to set at liberty them that are oppressed. When you read the text in the political context of its time, his inaugural address is a pronouncement of his divine appointment that includes a struggle for, to wrestle with, to bring justice to his people. And he's looking for his followers today to go a little deeper in our care of his people. Go a little deeper in being interested in all of God's people. You know, Ellen G. White says on page 154 of The Desire of Ages, she says, and I quote, let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he did for the benefit of men. Consider what Jesus points out for, to us in Matthew 5, 6 and Matthew 6, 33. 
In Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after justice. In Matthew 6, 3, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice. You'll notice I use the word justice instead of righteousness. And that is because the Greek word here for righteousness is daikaiosuna, daikaiosuna. Students of biblical Greek know the term can be translated both ways. However, unlike the word righteousness, which is one-dimensional and focuses on individual piety, Justice connotes collective social rightness. So Jesus' use of the word daikaiosuna can be understood as including both of the terms meaning. That is personal righteousness and social righteousness. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after personal righteousness and social rightness. Social righteousness, social justice. To those of you who may say, well, Jesus spoke up, but I don't think he called us to show up. I don't think he called us to spoke up. I don't think he called us to stand up at all. Take a look at your insert in your bulletins for further study, because you will see that Jesus called biblical prophets and biblical judges to stand up in certain times of Earth's history. When we look at the book of Judges, for example, Judges 2, let's look at Judges 2, verse 16. Judges 2, verse 16. It says, then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Biblical judges worked to free tribes of Israel from oppression. Today, we would call them freedom fighters. A significant aspect of the period of judges that should shape our thinking is that God selected temporary leaders in times of crisis to speak up and stand up and show up to touch the world's hurt. Then you look at the period of biblical prophets in the Bible. Today, prophets, the word prophets, it's synonymous with foretelling, predicting the future. But the primary task of biblical prophets was not foretelling, it was forthtelling. They were spokespeople for God. They were commissioned, they were called to oppose oppression and exploitation. Prophets were never called to support the status quo. They were always called to challenge the status quo. So how did we get to this Jesus as meek and mild? How did we get to that point? Well, the legacy can be traced back to the Roman Emperor Constantine's cycle of distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love how one biblical scholar puts it, when Constantine converted to the faith, he converted the faith to Constantine. And the modern church tax exempt status can be traced back to Constantine when he granted a full and complete exemption, tax exemption to all churches. And he appointed church leaders and he got rid of church leaders at will. And so churches tried to stay out of the affairs of everything so that they could keep that church tax exempt status. And it continued, and it continued. So by the time of the American Revolution, nine out of the 13 original colonies were granting some tax relief to churches. So you look around our church today, God's church today, and you see a community of believers who are hesitant to stand up against immoralities, against oppression, against things that hurt the most vulnerable because we have a political system that discourages it. But like biblical prophets and judges of old, God is raising up courageous people 
who will stand up for him in the face of retribution. God used Dr. Martin Luther King to use the words of the old prophet Amos and say to a whole nation, let justice rain down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And when we look around today, we see pastors of various faiths who are saying, and they're shaking their heads at the injustices that we see all around us. And pastors of various faiths are saying, no, it's time for us to apply faith and justice. And they're leading movements like the Poor People's Campaign and the Moral Mondays by William Barber in North Carolina. And Jim Wallace leading Sojourners. And you've got the Micah Challenge, a Christian campaign to end poverty. And you've got the Justice Conference that meets all over the world, standing up for the least of these. But where are the Adventists? Where are the Adventists? The early Adventist church stood up for justice. Our pioneers were anti-slavery advocates. The first president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church used his farm in New York as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Ellen White instructed Adventists to disregard the Fugitive Slave Act, which imposed a fine, even though it imposed imprisonment, if you did not return escaped slaves, she said, forget about it, we're not doing it. We're standing up for injustice. And pioneers like Joseph Bates and James White were also strong anti-slavery advocates. But then our church got silent. And we took a hands-off approach against injustices after Ellen White's death and the Bible conference of 1919, our church no longer stood up for injustices. But then came the civil rights movement and some strong black leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist church says, oh no, the God we serve says we have to speak up for injustices. And we had brave leaders like Charles Dudley against the orders of the General Conference got involved and said, I'm participating in the freedom marches. And people and elders like C.D. Brooks and Frank Hale and E.E. E. Cleveland got involved and said, we are joining the freedom marches and we're speaking up against social injustices. I love this quote from E.E. Cleveland in 1969, in a book in 1969, he wrote, and just picture E.E. Cleveland saying this in his thunderous voice. He said, Adventists, pacism, regarding social justice is a quote, type of self-righteous inertia, incompatible with true service to God. Can't you just picture him saying that? Matter of fact, we have some of our members here at Brinklow that stood up during the civil rights movement so we can sit down today and worship. But what about today? What about today? Who is picking up the torch to do justice in our community, in our Adventist community? Who is answering the call? when the world is bleeding and the most vulnerable are saying, we want more than a handout. We want laws to end gun violence in our schools. We want reforms in our criminal justice system that's killing our unarmed black men. We want better schools, not more prisons in our communities. And we want God's people, all of God's people deserve access to quality health care. So where are the Adventists? I believe Brinklow cares. That's our logo, right? Brinklow cares. That's a part of our mission. Brinklow cares. You know, it's been said that Brinklow is the highest tithe-paying church in all of Allegheny East Conference. It's been said 
that Brinklo has worshipers who are part of the who is who in black Adventism. It's been said that Brinklo members have some of the greatest access and resources and influence to be found in most Seventh-day Adventist church. It's been said. Well, if we are uniquely blessed as individuals, and we are uniquely blessed as a congregation, could there be a reason that God put us together to worship in the same sanctuary? Is there a greater purpose for a membership here at Brinklow? I believe Brinklow Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church members are uniquely positioned with resources, access, and influence to lead the rest of our brothers and sisters in the Allegheny East Conference, if not the entire North American division, on a mission to touch the world's hurt. I believe if we got together collectively as members with all our resources, all our access and influence, and we wanted to send a direct message, unedited, unfiltered, to the county executive of Montgomery County, where more children in Montgomery County are food insecure than any other county in the state, someone at Brinklow has the connections to get it done. I believe if we collectively got together with all our resources, access, and influence to send a direct message, unedited, unfiltered, to the governor of Maryland, where one in six children suffering hunger, someone at Brinkley has the connections to get it done. I believe if we got together collectively with all our resources, access and influence to send a direct message, unedited, unfiltered, to the President of the United States of America, where one in every eight Americans suffer from hunger, someone at Brinklow has the connections to get it done. Brinklow, at its time to touch the world's hurt. In closing, I'm reminded of the story of Esther that most of you are familiar with. Remember her cousin Mordecai would not bow down to Haman? And Haman was so angry that he said to himself, I just don't even want to kill just Mordecai. I want to just kill all of his people. And so he came up with a plan. I want to kill all the Jews young and old, women and children, in one day, kill them all in one day, and then I'm going to confiscate their property. And he got the king to sign off on his plan. And Mordecai sent a copy of that decree to Queen Esther, and he sent her a message. And he said to her that message in Esther 4, 8, he said, basically he said, Esther, God has put you in a position with access, resource, and influence to the king. And God has put you in that position to help his people. You must speak up for God's people. The scripture says, Esther responded with excuses. Excuses, you know, excuses like we do. Oh, pray about it. Let's just put it in God's hands. Esther sent her excuse back to Mordecai, saying basically, oh, I could get killed for that. But this is the part of the story I don't want us to miss in Esther 4, 12 through 14. When Mordecai responded to Esther's excuse, Mordecai basically said, listen, if you don't speak up for God's people, Trust and believe God will raise up someone else to help his people, but you will be destroyed. And then he added, who knows if God has you in this position for such a time as this. I want to submit to you today that at this time, in this moment of Earth's history, 
If we don't speak up and stand up and show up, God will raise up others to touch the world's heart. Let us walk on the right side of history, on the right side of true religion, on the right side to do justice. Thank you.